so you guys all sat down anyways, that's good. Um, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and open them to the book of Acts, and we'll be in chapter 13. And uh, for a sermon titled, Acts chapter 13, Tuwilla edition. Uh, no, uh, it was funny because Chris is like, hey, so can you do steak and study? And I said, yeah, man, I'd be absolutely honored and, and blessed to do it. I, I, I highly uh, respect Chris and, and Lydia and their whole family. And so it was an honor to be able to do it. And he's like, hey, would you be able to teach maybe the next night? And I'm like, absolutely. As long as you're okay with me just doing the next chapter uh, in Acts, we're good. Because uh, one thing at Calvary, we're not really great at uh, topical messages. So I, I like going from Acts 12 right into Acts 13. And actually, both of these messages are great. Um, I spoke last night, again, at the Stake and Study. If you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Pastor BJ. I'm from Yucca Valley, California. Um, I moved there from Twin Falls, Idaho about 13 years ago. And uh, it's been a blessing uh, to be there. I teach every Sunday night and every Wednesday night. Uh, and whenever Pastor Gerald's gone, I teach those studies as well. Um, I'm married. Uh, I've been married for almost 19 years. I have, uh, we have a picture to show just so I can prove it to you. Uh, so uh, and there's me. I, I do understand that I'm literally glowing. I don't know what's going on with my head, but uh, it was, yeah, I, was, I got a halo. I thought it was a pretty sweet picture. It was at Christmas time. And uh, so there's my family. My daughter, Laura, is 11 years old. Uh, she's the sweetest, most kindest, gentlest, most thoughtful little girl in the world. Vera is such a sweet little girl, and I'm just going to say that she's full of life. Um, and then uh, my wonderful uh, wife on the right, her name is Audrey. Uh, but one thing that's interesting that the picture is not showing is uh, she's pregnant with our third. And so uh, yesterday I shared it with Steak and Study, and I hadn't told Chris. He picked me up from the airport, and I hadn't told my uncle who's sitting in the back and I just dropped it. And I don't know whose face was more hilarious because Chris was almost like there was like a punchline coming, uh, but it didn't ever came. And then my uncle was like looking at Isaac, his, his son going like, is this real? And it's real. And uh, it's very, very early on. And there's some people that are like, well, why would you share something like that? It, there, there's a lot of testing and things that need to happen. Listen, my, my idea is to share it with you so you can partner with me in prayer. I don't think I'm in a better spot than to be in the spot for letting as many people as I know it can be that we can all partner in prayer. And so I'm blessed. And, uh, you know, last time I had a child, I announced to the whole church that it was going to be a boy. And it was not a boy. It was a girl. But I announced to the whole church what the name was going to be. And uh, so everyone cheered. It was great. It was a big service. It was on a Sunday morning. And I said, so everyone, little Liam Rampage is going to be born. And some people are like, Rampage? That sounds crazy, but they know I'm weird, so they all clap. <laughs> and uh, what was really funny, though, is I ended up having a girl, so I have a little Vera Lee, uh, who is just everything I needed in life. Uh, but <laughs> all this, uh, one, one week, I got this uh, baby dedication, because Pastor Gerald was out of town, and I was teaching for him, and I look at the name, and the first name of this child was Rampage. <laughs> and I was like, You've got to be kidding me. And so when I dedicated this baby, at first I told Gerald, he's like, well, maybe if you named your kid a good Christian name, you would have a boy, you know? <laughs> and so, uh, so I was dedicating this baby, and I just had to say it. I was like, well, that's an interesting name. Where did you get that one? And everyone started laughing. So if anyone's thinking about, hey, what is he going to name his kid because he has such good names, uh, boy or girl, I'm between two names, so if you want to take it, that's fine. It's either Meatball Sub or Philip Cheese. We're going to call him Philly for, for short. So uh, you could take those, run with them. I won't be mad at all. Uh, meatball Sub, I would go with that one if I were you guys. But uh, what an awesome blessing it is to be here today. Again, Acts chapter 13. Um, yeah, we got some, some raising of a hand too. Yeah, so we don't quite know how we're related yet. We tried to figure that out yesterday. It's like an in-law, brother thing. We just call each other brothers. It's good. Uh, so yeah, Pastor Gerald is my stepdad. Uh, everyone knows how cool it is to be a stepson. Uh, so uh, no, it's been an awesome thing. So, uh, But we've been going through the book of Acts. And even yesterday, uh, we went through it. And I'm just going to give you some context to kind of catch you up to where we're at. Um, in the first chapters, what we've seen is this group, ever since the ascension of Jesus, we've seen this group that was, uh, the Holy Spirit had come upon them, and they were just completely captivated, activated, and motivated by the power of the Holy Spirit. And what we saw yesterday as the men's group was this persecution was coming against the church in the form of Herod, who was murdering the first apostle uh, that, that he had ever murdered, was James. He, he, he threw the other one in prison. He threw Peter in prison. 
And this was all being done to appease the people that couldn't stand the Christians. Um, really not so much that he cared. It was more of the fact that everyone else cared, and he was just trying to solidify his political power. But while Peter was in prison, one thing we looked at was the, the church of God began to pray. And, and what we saw is when they prayed, everything began to change. Uh, change. The, the, the Peter who was chained to these guards that were also being guarded by guards who also had an iron gate, all these things were happening against them, and the Lord miraculously delivered Peter from this prison. And what we saw next is if Peter tends to go over to his friend's house, and, and what a joy it would be to one minute you think you're in jail, the next minute he's at your front door knocking, and uh, he begins to talk to this, this woman through the door. She was already on high alert because they're killing Christians out there, so uh, she's just kind of talking to him through the door. He, she could understand his voice. He must have had a very uh, noticeable voice, like something like, uh, like, you know, hurry up, let me in, it's Peter. You know, like, I don't know exactly how it was, but he had a voice that instantly goes, oh my gosh, it's Peter. And she ran in and said, Peter's at the door, I know that voice. And instead of believing that God could do a work that they prayed about, they called her crazy. They said, that, that just can't be happening. And do you not know that he's in prison, that he's in jail? And, and then someone was like, oh, she's beside herself. Another person was like, I know what it was. It's the guardian angel of Peter, because that made a lot of sense. They came up with all sorts of things, except that Peter couldn't be at the door. Church, I, I, my heart to the men yesterday is when we pray, we should be expecting the Lord to do great things. Amen? We should expect that the, that, that the God of the universe hears us and he loves us. And like, uh, like Pastor Chris was saying, just even with communion, he, he wants that relationship with us that as, as my daughters come to me and ask for things and tell me about their life, there's nothing more he likes to do than to listen to that. And so when we talk to our father, just like when my kids make petitions to me, I try to do them if it's in the right will of them. Like if it's going to work out for them, I want to make it happen. And so we have to understand when we pray to the Lord, we need to believe that God is in control. And what we ended with last, uh, last night was we saw that there was this contrast between Herod, the one that was killing Christians and persecuting them. He ended up being, uh, spoiler alert, died and uh, ate alive by worms. Uh, <laughs> that's a great way to end a study, uh, but especially for a men's group. But when that happened, the word of God continued to grow and grow. And here we are thousands of years later, still studying the word of God. Isn't God good? Amen. So where we're going to pick up is chapter 13, verses 1 through 12. And let's go ahead and look at it to today. I'm going to read through it real fast. It says, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, and the Tetrarch and Saul. And they to the Lord and they fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called for them. And they, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, Cilicia, and from there they went to Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, or Sol Salamis, but it, I, it's the sandwich you know, place, they, they preached the word of God in the synagogues and of the Jews. And it says that they, they, had, uh, they had John as their assistant, now, when they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. And this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, we'll get to that, that's hilarious, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the truth. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at the man, and he said, O oh, full of all deceit and all you fraud, and you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for some time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand, and then the proconsul believed. And when he saw all that they had done, he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we are astonished at your word. Lord, whenever we open it, Father, it doesn't matter who is speaking. If they are reading your word, there's something in it for each of us. Lord, we're, we're just so thankful that you work uh, as a congregation and, and, and us together. But Lord, you do a personal work in each one of our hearts. And so, Lord, that's all we're praying for. Lord, we, we don't need to invite you here. You're already here. 
But Lord, one thing that I do want to invite you to do is to break down walls, to break down barriers, to break down the things that we put up in our flesh. And we just want to have uh, you glorified in here tonight and our lives changed into the image of your son more and more each day. So Lord, would you do a just great work as we sit here. Bless this church. Bless this congregation. And we love you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. Let's look at verses 1 through 3 as we just begin to break it down as we're accustomed to doing here. Uh, it says, now uh, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Patriarch, and Saul. And as they ministered to the Lord and they fasted, the Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, having fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and then they sent them away. Church, I, I love scriptures like this. Just It's so easy to read past like the first few verses and then kind of go into the part that you think is the most entertaining or whatever. But there's so much going on here at the very beginning because when you look at the people that are gathered, it's interesting. Most likely you have people or people from different colors. Most likely you have people of, you know, obviously from different places and different upbringings. They have different callings. They have different personalities. In this church right now, I'm looking out, and it is a ragtag bunch of people. It's the same with my church. I look out, and I'm like, on any other time, if I did not know the Lord, we wouldn't all be gathered together on a Wednesday night. But you know what happens? The unity of the Holy Spirit brings all ages, all colors, transcends everything. And that's exactly what you're seeing here, because church, what you guys share, and, and whether you're 90 years old or whether you're 15, what everyone shares is this deep faith and this deep love in Christ. And that's what these people had. I love that God brings together with the unity of his Holy Spirit. And that's a common thread that all of us can have. That God transcends with all this division in the world. God transcends all of that. He, descends, he transcends all the things that people want us to fight about, like race and, and, and po politics and all those things that are constantly thrown at us that are trying to divide us. Jesus can unite us under the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see these five guys. They're sitting there completely unified together. And, and what do we see them doing? It says they ministered and they prayed to the Lord and they fasted. They heard from God about the next steps of their life because they did those things. Because they were praying, because they were fasting, because they were seeking the Lord's will, guess what? The Lord spoke to them. I love what Chris said, during, just even during the communion message, he said, don't just necessarily take it to go back and tell the Lord everything you want. Instead, listen. And, and if you're listening to the Lord, he will speak to you, and especially through his word. About seven or eight years ago, uh, I needed some real wisdom from the Lord. Um, I got offered this situation in Twin Falls, Idaho, uh, that's actually where I'm from, and so the idea was, you know, I'm going to talk about this in a second too, but I could return back to where I grew up. Uh, I've been raised in ministry for the, like the last 10 years or whatever, and I'd be able to, to go there and, 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 and just start teaching at this church. And, you know, I, I just didn't know. I, I basically told Gerald, I don't, I don't feel called there, but you also are my spiritual father and quite literally my boss and my stepfather, so whatever you're telling me to do, I'm going to do it, right? He kind of wears a lot of hats in my life. Uh, so I, he's like, you know, just go check it out. And I remember I was there for about three months, and my wife had quit her job and, and moved down there as well. And as, as we went down there together, we just didn't feel it. The church was growing. Things were going great, but we always felt called back to where we were at home. And so I finally just got a hold of him, and I was like, I don't know what you want me to do. Do you want me to stay here? Because if you're telling me that this is what you have for me, I'm going to do it because I respect who you are. And he's like, have you prayed and fasted about it yet? And I said, no, ab absolutely not. I have not. I'm eating because I'm stressed out, you know? Like, <laughs> like, I haven't fasted from anything. I've gained weight, if anything. And he's like, well, try to pray and try to fast. And so I, I declared a fast to the people that were left there. I said, hey, listen, my wife and I are trying to figure out what to do. And we only want to be in the will of the Lord for you guys and for us. I said, if it's up to us, I feel like we're returning home, but... Let's just pray and fast. And we all did it together, like all the people that were on staff, the worship leader that was still there because there, there was like a division in the church. And so we had some of the people left, but we began to fast. And it was so cool that as we began to fast, just even for one meal a day, at lunch, instead of eating, we gathered together and we prayed about just direction and vision. And we knew that the Lord was leading me back. They knew that the Lord was leading me back. And I called Gerald and I said, Gerald, we all have been fasting and praying for now for a couple weeks. And, and I feel led back. 
And he said, that's good because I need you to teach this Sunday. And I was like, it all worked out. And from that point, I've been being raised up since I've been there. But even for your own pastor here. See, I know a different Chris who's always been a fantastic pastor, but I, I, I didn't know Chris the senior pastor. I knew Chris the assistant pastor. And what was awesome is there was a time coming where I remember he even talking with Lydia. I feel a stirring. And he didn't know exactly where or what he was doing or where he was going, but he could feel a stirring. And he needed this point that, man, the most major steps of our life is about ready to be made. Lord, where do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go? Who do you want us to preach to? How does this happen? And he began to pray, uh, pray and he began to fast. And there was plenty of that. You know, listen. Praying and fasting has a way of clearing out the noise and, and centering yourself back on the Lord. And he heard from the Lord, and, and the Lord opened doors to come to this place. And what an amazing place it is to be. You know, Mark 9, 20 through 29, there's a story about Jesus. And it says they, they brought this man to Jesus, and when he saw Jesus, Jesus, immediately there was a spirit that began to convulse him. And he fell to the ground, and this man became to wallow, foaming at the mouth, and he asked his father, Jesus asked his father, so how long has this been happening to him? And the man said, from childhood. And often he throws himself into the fire, and he throws him into water to destroy him. But if you could do anything, then have compassion on us, Jesus, and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Is that not a good word? That is a good word. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father cried out in tears, and he said, Lord, I believe but please help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit and he said, you deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to come out of him and enter him no more. Now picture this, this is insane. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And the boy became one as it was dead. And everyone was like, he is dead. Like, is that not weird? Like this guy has this violent reaction and Jesus is like, come out of him. And then they're like, yeah, he, he died. <laughs> He's, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. And this is just amazing. He lifted him up and he arose. And when he came into the house, his disciples asked him privately. Now listen, this is for us too. Like, why could we not cast him out? And Jesus looked at him and said, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. Jesus didn't have time to go, you know what? This one only comes out by prayer and fasting. You know what I'm going to do? Spend two weeks, pray and fast. Then I could cast it out. I mean, there was no time for that. There was no time for that demon to be cast out in a little while. It's been trying to kill him his whole life. So instead of running to pray and fast, Jesus has been living a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. It's an interesting idea to apply to our own lives. You know, we see another story in Matthew 6, 16 through 18. It says, Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, Moreover, when you fast, don't be like hypocrites with a sad, count sound, yeah, sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they appear to men to be fasting. You know, we're not supposed to be sad when we're fasting or like complain about how hungry we are when we're fasting. I knew a guy that used to fast like that, like, lay off me, I'm fasting. You're like, I think you're missing it, bro. I think I, <laughs> you're, you're kind of ruining it. You're kind of ruining it for everybody. He says, but when you, when you fast, anoint your head, and I, and I underlined that because it's when you fast, not if you fast. When you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to be uh, fasting to men, but to your Father who is in the secret place, and, and your Father who is in that secret place will reward you openly. Fasting is to be done to the Lord, and it's another level of clarity. It's another level of power that we need for our life to focus on the Lord. And so that's what these men did. These five guys got together, and they, they made a burger shop called, no, uh, they, these five guys got together, and they prayed and fasted, and they heard from the Lord. Paul and Barnabas were to be sent out by these five. They were to be, they were all serving the Lord, so it's not like they're like, these people can serve the Lord. No, all of them were serving the Lord, but when they prayed, God said, I want these two to go do something. They are to be set apart for a special purpose, and so begins Paul's first missionary journey here, and that's what we're going to be looking at, and, and you're welcome to read on on your own time uh, this place. He goes on this missionary journey, but I want you to notice how that calling was recognized in someone like Paul and Barnabas. And they, they, all they did is they basically got together, they prayed, and after they, God confirmed it, they laid hands on them. And then they sent them out. But I want you to see that it wasn't because they wanted them to go. It wasn't like, well, Paul and Barnabas have been really bothering me lately, so they should definitely go, you know? They should go. And it wasn't that they thought that, the, you know, that, that they wanted them to go, but it was more that that's what the Lord wanted. 
These men laid hands recognizing a calling, not giving them the calling. They recognized the calling of the Lord that was already upon their lives. Church, at Joshua Springs, my church, you maybe heard Pastor Gerald share, he has a heart for raising up the next generation. That's just been in him since I've known him. But he started Calvary Bible Institute, and so often that's exactly what we see, is we see these people that come through, and, and these CBI students, by the end of the time we see them, you can see the calling upon their life. I mean, th- when they walk in the door, they have a lot of fervor and a lot of excitement for the Lord, but you can't necessarily see the calling. But after you spend a couple minutes with them, you can see what the Lord has done and, and recognize the work that the Lord had done in their lives and the calling of the Lord that's upon them. Maybe you guys know Josh Parker. Anyone know him? He's more than just a good, great barista, which he's fantastic at, right? It's so funny. I, I told him I wasn't going to share this story, but he's not here, so it doesn't matter. No, it doesn't. He's not going to hear it. So uh, when he was in my junior high, he, I was his youth pastor at one time. And he was in my junior high, I mean, sorry, he was in my high school. And he started telling me, he's like, so what does a pastor even do? Like, it was like kind of like this kind of weird, I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you guys just like sit around and like read the Bible all day. And I was like, oh man. And then he went to CBI and he was like, I was so wrong. <laughs> like, I was so wrong. There's so much ministry to be done. But here's the thing. Josh Parker, towards the end of the CBI, and even from the minute he checked in, we didn't know exactly what the calling was, but we could see that the Lord had a calling upon his life. And by the time he was done, we all recognized that the Lord has his hand upon this man's life. And we are so excited to hook him up with Chris because he wasn't finished. I mean, we're never finished, but he's a young kid still learning and growing, and we send him to Chris who's pouring into him, and and it's just so amazing. So I walked into his office, and he was sitting at his table, and he was sitting at his computer. I was like, what do you do here? Do you just sit around and read your Bible all day? And he was like, oh, what's going on? And then Chris was like, hey, have you installed that speaker yet? I'm like, oh, he's learning. He's learning. For Pastor Chris, when he was sent out, the same thing, man. We saw it for years. I mean, I was just only there for a few years while he was there, but hearing the way people talked about Chris, like, you know, it, it was, there was a lot of respect, and, and, and a lot of people really liked him, and the board recognized him as a leader and as a pastor, and, and when he started to feel the stirring of the Lord upon his life to be a senior pastor, we were all like, amen. Where, where, where are we going? And we prayed, and then he wound up here. The hand of the Lord was evident upon his life. So with all this being said, Joshua Springs sends these people out to minister all over the world. However, we cannot give them their gifts or their calling. That's all from the Lord. All that we can do as a church, and if you guys ever send people or go do these things, all you can do is we recognize the calling of the Lord upon your life. But I also want you to see how they did it. They, they didn't just go in and, and, and just go, you know what, Paul and Barnabas seem great. Let's lay hands on them. Instead, there was prayer and there was fasting. And we should never lay hands on people too suddenly. Because that's also a scary thing within the church when you just be like, oh, yeah, that guy's been my friend for three weeks. Let's make him a pastor of the church, you know? Doesn't work out. First Timothy 5.22 tells us, do not lay hands on someone hastily, nor share other people's sins. Keep yourself pure. The laying on of hands should never be the opportunity that we think someone deserves. It's what the Lord has called upon their life. Let's continue uh, on in the story, verses 4 through 5. It, it starts to pick up. I'm not going to keep you here all night, I promise. Uh, it says, so when he had, re- uh, sorry, in verse uh, 4 and 5, it says, so being, out of the ho- uh, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and there they called, uh, uh, sorry, there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, I, I have to say Salamis just because it's fun to say, they preached the word of God in the synagogues to the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. This would be John Mark, who's uh, basically Barnabas' nephew. And in verse 6, uh, yeah, let's just start there. Let's start in verse 5, just end on verse 5 so I can kind of talk about that. So their journey is beginning. They're, they're ready to be sent out. They're ready to do whatever the Lord has called them to do, recognized by the laying on of hands, being led by the Spirit. And here's where they're going to go. I want to show a picture of a map. So this is where they're going to go. So this makes it very much more real. They started in Antioch. Cilicia is right there. They jump across the pond here, and they go to Salamis, the sandwich uh, capital of the world, and then they go to Paphos, which is just right there. So this is right there where they were. This is the first part of their tour. And it was funny, as I began to picture them doing this missionary tour, they're probably really excited to be sent out by the Lord. So I kind of pictured Paul, like, coming up with these tour posters, because it really looks like a tour route, you know? Like, if you were in a band, you'd want to do the most effective tour route you could get with as many people as you could witness to. So I made him a tour poster. Go ahead and click the next one. So, 
So, I, I, yeah, I was like, hey, we need to make a tour poster, and there's all the dates listed. It's fantastic. It's great. You're welcome to uh, take that and put it on a shirt. I don't, I don't know. It's, it's a pretty sweet, pretty sweet logo. But Barnabas and Paul are on this mission. They're on this tour, and they're ready to, to have two big mission statements. This is what they want to do. We want to reach as many people as possible with the gospel, and we want to start with cities with synagogues. They understood something. In synagogues, on the Sabbath, there was people reading the scriptures. The books of Moses, but they were reading the scriptures. And they knew if they could go in there as, hey, I'm a visiting rabbi. You know, a lot of times visiting rabbis would be called to speak at these services. And they knew this because, you know, (laughs) Paul's a Pharisee of the Pharisees, you know, before. So he knows that if there's a visiting rabbi, they were going to want him to say a word of exhortation, which actually happens in the next chapter. But it's funny because they walk in, they'd be like, hey, do you want to share something? He's like, who, me? Yes, it's about Jesus. You know, that's what they would do. They'd point to Jesus all through the first five books of the Bible. And that first stop that they were at was on this island of Cyprus in a home of Barnabas. This first place they went is where Barnabas actually grew up. You know, previous relationships would maybe they would be able to show people what God had done in their life. It's an amazing thing to return home. It's always been different for me. Uh, returning home to Twin Falls, I usually go there once a year. My wife still has family there. Her grandpa's 101 years old. Yeah, and he's still like all there. I'm like, I don't want to sound, I mean, I almost said, are you ever going to die? But I didn't want to say that. I mean, he's healthy. He's going. I'm like, man, how do you do it? Uh, but anyways, he, he's 101 years old. And whenever we go back, we kind of go into church. and We go to different churches. We go to her church and we go to the church I grew up in. And it's kind of weird because you walk in and there's two different groups of people when you return home. When you train, return back, like Barnabas would, there'd be two different groups of people. There's one group that are like, man, have you seen BJ? Man, the Lord has done something crazy in his life. He's, he's patient. He went to pick me up. And instead of just laying on the horn when I wasn't there in three minutes, he like waited and prayed for me. It was wild. BJ's a completely different guy. But then there's also the other side that never really followed up with me. And they're like, BJ? Like, are you serious? That chubby kid that used to take, coats, uh, take cuts in the donut line? You know? Yeah, we know, BJ. And it's like, uh, to which I reply to them, nay, I am now a chubby man taking cuts in the donut line. It's a chubby man, okay? Uh, but, that, but that's the thing. You go back, two people have an idea of you. One knows how you grew up, and one knows who you are now. And Jesus even spoke about this when he said, Assuredly, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. Returning home to where you preach, uh, returning home to where you grow up to preach the gospel can be one of the most fruitful things, but truthfully, it can be one of the most difficult things. So let's see what happens in verses 6 through 8. And then it says, Now when they had gone through the island of Paphos, that's on the west side of the island, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. And this man called for Barnabas and Saul, and he sought to hear the word of God. Verse 8 says, um, uh, says, sorry, but Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Interesting, interesting, interesting scripture. Um, another truth, if you're ever going to step out and preach to, the, preach to someone, even, even if it's a friend in the car and there's someone in the back seat, it doesn't have to be like, when I talk about preaching, I'm not talking about being a pastor of a church. Literally, I'm talking about the, the opportunity that you have to speak to people that I can't speak to. People that will listen to you well over listening to a pastor. You know, your friends at work, whoever it is. So whenever you have a chance to step out and, and preach the gospel, or even just say, God bless you, or man, can I pray for you? You got to understand that sometimes you're going to face demonically charged opposition. And that's what you're seeing here. And opposition from the enemy, man, it can come in many different ways. But I believe the most common opposition are difficult people that are set into your life. People that are just there to discourage you, to not want to carry on anymore, like this guy did here. People that are there that make you want to quit. People that are just there to uh, attempting to steal the seeds of the gospel which you're planting. You know, if they can say something right after you, right after you prayed for someone, they're like, oh, you really believe that, blah, blah, blah demonically charged opposition. Barnabas and Paul, they just started to witness on this island of Cyprus, and things were going pretty well. People were listening to them. And then they get to the west side of this island called Paphos, and they were presented with an opportunity that could only be from the Lord. 
It could only be from the Lord. You have, to, you have to see that this was an absolute move of the Spirit because there was a man, this is a Roman-controlled island. So there's this man there in Cyprus who, who, who's a, you know, they had to have a Roman official there. And so it's similar to like that of a governor. And so picture the governors there, this man Sergius Paulus, and the only thing he's described as in the scripture is an intelligent man. So we have to assume he was a heathen, he was a, a pagan, but he had heard about these guys preaching and they must have done it pretty well because people are, are asking about him. He's like, well, bring him here. I want to hear about them. I was <laughs> comparing it to the governor we have in California. And I was like, picture like Governor Newsom being like, hey, I want to hear the gospel. I mean, only the Lord could do something like that. But what makes this story amazing to me is being able to witness the Holy Spirit drawing a complete heathen in his heart before he even knew the Lord. He had heard about it, and the Lord's already working in his life to get him to a spot where he's able to hear the gospel and be saved. And there's, a ri- there's, there's, there's no reason to believe that he is anything or any sort of God-fearer or anything like that. Rather, because he's an intelligent man, he's interested in hearing something. And people that are often unintelligent won't even want to hear what you have to say. But someone that truly believes, you know, man, I'll, I'll give him a chance. I'll listen to him. That's what this guy was doing. And he was requesting them and seeking after them. And so they showed up. And church, I'm going to tell you, when you serve the Lord, the Lord's going to put the opportunities in your life. You don't have to go out there and look for them. You don't. I mean, I know there's people like, we need to go out and find people to preach to. Listen, the Lord will bring them to you. The Lord's going to bring them in a car on the way, carpooling to work. The Lord's going to bring them at lunch. The Lord's going to bring them at the lady at the grocery store. The Lord's going to bring these people. It's up to us to seize that opportunity. It's It's up to us to open our mouths and just remain faithful to that calling that the Lord put there. You know, whatever that is. You know, a few years back, my mom and I had to go to Idaho um, because uh, I had a, my best friend's mom had actually committed suicide, and um, I did his mom's celebration of life service, and on the, dr- on the drive home, it was just me and my mom, which is already kind of bizarre, because Gerald's almost with us all the time, but we're right outside Las Vegas, and it's hot, and our car breaks down, and it's so hot in the middle of the desert, and um, we have been waiting for hours. I actually started to kind of walk around the desert. By the way, that's really scary to do, because there's a lot of weird things in the desert. I don't know what people are doing out there, but I don't know, it's definitely terrifying. But about, we called AAA, and Gerald's on the phone in Yucca Valley trying to get a hold of someone to come get us in Las Vegas or right outside of it. And um, it was so funny, my mom would call. And this is, this, you guys don't, you know, you're not going to talk to my mom, who cares? So, uh, so my mom, she would call these AAA, and like for a while she's like, hey, we need you to come get us, here's where we are. Two or three hours, we were out there for eight hours waiting for someone to pick us up. But every hour she would call back and it would be more dramatic. She'd be like, all right, Beach, I need to go ahead and call the people now. So just, just be quiet. I'm like, okay. The phone would ring. She'd be like, it's so hot. It's so hot. I'm out here in the desert. And I'm running out of water. I'm an old lady. She said that. I'm an old lady. My mom would never call herself an old lady except if she was trying to get someone to hurry. They're like, ma'am, do you need to call a medic? No, we just need someone to show her. Please help. So anyways, hopefully they're here quick. You know, I'm like, you are a sneaky snake. Anyways, finally this guy shows up out of nowhere, and he shows up, and, and he, he loads us in his car, and he, uh, sorry, the tow truck, the tow truck puts the, the, the car up on the thing, and, and, and we begin to talk to this guy, and he's stuck in this car now with my mom and I, and, and he begins to talk to us. He begins to talk about all the horrible things, and almost like PTSD he's talking about, like the horrible things. He works that whole highway. And the, the people that he's seen burnt alive inside of cars, the people he's seen die in cars, how he would bring that home with him, and he ruined his he ruined his family, he ruined his marriage because he turned to alcohol, and he's just sharing this stuff. Little does he know, he's sharing it with a pastor and a pastor's wife, and so we're listening, and, and we're just listening to this guy, and I just began to witness to him, and I'm like, man, like I'm so sorry, and I just began to pray for him. I began to tell him how much the Lord loves him, and how how mortal all of our life is, and is your heart right with the Lord today, and. He began to talk how he was raised in church and yada, yada, yada. But what was interesting is so much just like this. The Lord brought someone in my path for me to witness to. And I began to tell him, our car broke down so that you could hear the gospel message today. The Lord is going to put people in your path that will want to be interested in what you're going to say. So very similar, you see this. The word is being spoke. The seed is falling on the uh, fertile soil. And right as it looks like something's going to happen, in comes this man. He's a false prophet. That's how he's labeled. I tell you one thing. I wouldn't want to be labeled a false prophet in the scripture. That's, that's like the worst. 
but he goes by the name Bar Jesus. Now, what Bar Jesus means is the son of Jesus or the son of the Savior. And so he has enough nerve to call himself son of Jesus. And this man's coming in to steal the gospel. And what we're going to see in a minute is Paul doesn't like this guy at all. Paul doesn't like this guy. Paul doesn't like what he's doing. But you know who else doesn't like this guy? The author of the book, Luke. He wants to tell you his name's not just Bar Jesus. He goes by another name, which he names in scripture. He also goes by Elemis the sorcerer. And actually, in the NIV, it's translated to this is actually what his name means. You can just see this hilarious kind of conversation going on between Paul and Elemis the sorcerer. You know, Paul's just sharing the gospel with this guy, and this guy's chiming in, and he begins to say, oh yeah, you know, don't believe that. Don't believe that proconsul. What he's saying is not true. And then Paul looks over at him with like a confused look, and he's like, what's your name? And he's like, yeah, my name? Bar Jesus. And he's like, oh, son of Jesus. That's, that's what you're going to go with? Your name's son of Jesus? And he's like, yeah, it's going to be a big negative for me. I'm not calling you that. And he's like, you have, you have to call me that. He's like, oh, I'm not going to call you that. And he's like, you know, I'm going to call you the name by everyone else calls you, and that's Elemis the sorcerer. And he's because here's the deal. It's not uncommon for Jews to have two names. You know, there's Saul and there's Paul. There's Elemis the sorcerer and Bar Jesus. I mean, go down the list, right? So he's like, I'm going to call you Elemis the sorcerer. That's the best I can do for you. And Elemis is like, I don't want to go by that name. He's like, well, I have a couple others. I can call you false prophet or falsy or false prophet is. So what? I'm, I'm not going to call you Bar Jesus. It's funny. And then Luke's like, and you can just see Paul like, and do not write Bar Jesus in your letter. Write Elemis the sorcerer. That guy was the worst, you know? Uh, but most likely this sorcerer, you're like, why is he even around? He was a hired hand from the, for the proconsul. And you know what he was worried about? He wasn't worried about the proconsul knowing about Jesus. He was worried about once the proconsul realizes he doesn't need a sorcerer in his life and that Jesus can take that spot in his heart, he was going to be out of a job. And so what he's going to do is he's going to try to take anything he can that's being shared. And it's an interesting thing to read th this man coming against Paul and Barnabas because Jesus talked about what happens whenever you preach the gospel. He talked about, th about it in Matthew 13. I'm not going to read it, but I'll read what he said when he explains uh, the, the explanation of the parable. In verse 18, he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Everyone who hears the word of the kingdom, uh, sorry, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes in and snatches it away, what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives the seed by the wayside. And church, this is exactly what the sorcerer is trying to do. The seed is falling on fertile soil, and this man's just trying to, to take it. And church, we are out, we are called to be faithful, to reach out to the world in the name of Jesus, powered with the gospel. But I'm going to tell you something, God is in charge of the rest. You don't need to worry about how much it fell on soil or what happened. You just be faithful to preach the word of God and let God do the rest. And you may never see the fruit within your lifetime. I know people that I've preached the word to when I was very young that have come back 20 years later and said, hey man, like I've got to let you know, like we've been watching you uh, on, on Facebook and, and man, what an awesome thing. We gave our hearts to the Lord. It's just crazy. You might never see it happen. All you are responsible to do is to preach the word of God. But look what happens in 9, and 12, 9 through 12 as we close. So it says this, then Saul, who is also called Paul, again, there's two names, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. Can you just picture, like, the, the, how much he doesn't like him? Like, when someone's talking and you're staring at them, like, you know, you just, you're just not into him, you know, and he's not into him. He says, oh, you full of all deceit and you fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of righteousness, with, with, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell upon him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Is that not crazy? It says, then the proconsul believed when he saw that what had been done, and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. I'll tell you what Paul didn't do. Paul didn't allow this demonic person to lead him to quit preaching the gospel. He didn't allow a few bad seeds that bummed him out to, to, to tell him to stop preaching the gospel. Rather, he looked at the will of the Lord. What does the Lord want in this situation? Paul's thinking, the will of the Lord is that this man does not perish. The will of the Lord is that this man shouldn't perish and that he should come to know Jesus in the same way that I knew Jesus. And anything standing against it is wicked, and God will deal with it. And then Paul begins to align himself as he's speaking in the middle of his speech through the Holy Spirit. He begins to align himself with God's will, and he begins to speak in complete spirit-filled boldness. This is exactly what he's doing. And it says here, Saul, who is called Paul, right? This is, this is the thing. 
Saul, who is called Paul, was looking intently at Bar Jesus. It's just this man, Saul, who is called Paul, means humble in spirit. You know, he's looking at a man called Son of Jesus. And, and just looking at him like, this guy over here, this is what he's doing right now. And then he gets filled with the Spirit, and spiritual discernment comes out that he should say this. And he did not pull any punches, did he? No, this was real. And then this is not something I suggest all of us to do, but boy, if it ever has to happen, and you know you have to say it, just open your mouth, and it might come out as, oh, you full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you know? That's pretty good. You enemy of righteousness, will you not cease from perverting the gospel? You're like, woo, woo. You didn't beat around the bush on that one. That's straight to the point. And you notice how clever his play is a play on words is there? This guy goes by son of Jesus. He's like, you're not son of Jesus. You're son of the devil. You know, like, I love that. And I love it. But Paul knew that there was a man's salvation at stake. Paul knew that this man was called to be, they were called to be there at this moment because the Lord had opened the door. And this man was standing in the way. And so he stood for righteousness. Paul had courage to say something that needed to be said through the power of the Holy Spirit to confront sin. What Paul was saying was only what God thought about the matter. There was nothing that Paul said that was in his flesh. Paul opened his mouth and he spoke the truth. Church, there is a time to remain silent and there's a time to stand for righteousness. And so many times Christians just stand quiet all the time. There's a fine balance in this, you know, because some of us in this room, maybe some of us at my church for sure, take that liberty way too far. We don't need to hear <laughs> all the things about, oh man, you're in sin, you're in blah, blah, blah. What we need to hear about is Jesus. So stop with whatever you're doing and tell them about Jesus. Some people are taking their liberties to call people sinners and yell from their, their high rooftops about how bad people are. It's like, no, no, no. How about you tell them about Jesus like this man was? That guy had already heard the gospel. He just turned and went the other way. But you know what? I'd rather be one like that than one that wasn't saying anything because they're afraid they might offend someone. Lord, please let us be receptive to when we are to be silent and when we are to be speaking your gospel and to stand for boldness. And look at the amazing thing that he does. Not only does he stand for boldness, but he pronounced judgment. He was so in tune with the Lord that he pronounced judgment. He's like, yeah, and you, you're, there's going to be like a dark mist that falls on you. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know what it means, but he couldn't see. You know, it's like, it's like a guy trying to walk to the bathroom at night, you know, and, it, you know and, it's, and it's dark, and you trip over your kid's Legos. Like, he doesn't know what's, none of you guys had that happen? Okay, for, for me, it's like a common occurrence. Like, it happens all the time, and it's not fun. Presumably, it lasted as long as Paul was there. And you're like, why did you choose blindness? Like, why didn't you come up with something better than that? Like, why didn't you come up with something real good? Well, because blindness is only reflecting what's going on in the man's heart. What's going on in the man's heart is you are completely blind, and now your out, outward appearance is going to match it. And you want to know how Paul knew? Because Paul was once blinded and walking around, not being able to see. And so he understood that this man was exactly like him at one time. Let's go back to the proconsul, but we kind of forgot about him, right? <laughs> like this whole problem's happening. We forgot about the whole reason it's happening. And here he is. You can just picture him kind of looking at both of them, like going back and forth. He's like, you son of the devil. And he's like, well, I can't see. And he's like... Oh, wow, what's going on? <laughs> you talked about Jesus, and now this guy's blind. I don't know what's happening. He had to be super confused at what's happening. But you know what was crazy? Even with all the crazy blindness and, and the, the conversation that's happening back and forth, he wasn't like, well, he got you, so I'm going to follow him. No, what he was astonished at was the teaching of the Lord through the power of the Holy Spirit. Not the miracles, not the, not the pronouncing of judgment. Not, he was... He was 100% astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And church, that is the most important thing at this church. And that is the most important thing that every single preacher across the country, across the world, should put on blast. That it is about Jesus. It is about Jesus and no church should ever budge on that. And if anyone tells us to, church, that's the time to stand. Churches are often so wrapped up into doing everything but preaching Jesus. There's churches that 100% put on their billboards healing rooms, except when COVID hit and they closed the healing rooms. I was like, what happened then? You know, you know, <laughs> it's like, I thought you're supposed to be able to heal, you, you heal cancer, but you can't heal COVID. That sounds weird. Uh, I mean, to me, that doesn't sound like my Lord, my Lord can heal, my Lord can heal anything, but maybe not in your room. Anyways, I don't know where that came from, but churches, 
churches often get wrapped up into everything but this, but here's the, th- here's the deal. When preaching Jesus, that's the greatest miracle of all. That Jesus crucified, risen from the dead for our sins, freed us from sin. That's the greatest miracle that you could ever keep. You have to keep your eyes focused on that same thing that changes lives today. This church has to keep their eyes focused on that same thing that changes lives today. But Chris isn't going to be able to argue anyone into the kingdom. All that he can be responsible for doing is to preach the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit and allow that to change their lives. It's inviting them maybe to come and see, you know, yesterday 11 men that have never been to this church showed up just to eat steak. That's awesome. I'll tell you, our men's ministry at our church looks huge. But then, like, if we were to offer no steak, it would look like a fourth that size. Like, but you know what? They're here hearing the gospel. That's what, we, that's what we do. That's why there's steak involved. It's inviting them to, hey, man, you should hear our pastor. He's awesome. He's easy to understand. Come on in on a Wednesday night. Come on in to a steak and study. It's inviting them to come and see. And you know what? They're not always going to be like, oh, I really want to go check out your church, bro. That sounds like a good time. My, we have these, your invited cards. You have the, come in, the Jesus cards, right? Okay, so my daughter has become obsessed with handing out those cards. And this is in closing. Don't worry, I'm not going to keep it too long. But um, my daughter's obsessed with handing it out. And she'll hand it out to anybody. And so I've seen her hand it out to a lady at Walmart. And she was there, and this old lady's there. And, of course, my daughter starts talking to this old lady. She's grandma. I don't know if she's really grandma, but she's grandma age, so I'm going to call her grandma. She's like 85. And she's sitting there, and she's like, do you like candy, little girl? And, like, I'm like, don't run. She seems okay, you know. And so she's sitting there, and she's like, yeah, I like this candy. And they begin to talk, and my daughter's beginning to, like, really warm up to this lady. And this lady's treating her like it's her granddaughter. And my daughter goes, can I invite you to church? It says, give Jesus a chance on the card, and on the back is all of our info. And the lady's like, where do you go to church, sweetheart? My daughter goes, Joshua Springs. And she just, her whole face lit up. And she began to cry. And she's like, can I give you a hug, Dad? Can I give her a hug? I said, sure. And Laura's hugging this old woman in the middle of Walmart. And I'm like, this is beautiful. It's beautiful. Then another time we were at Food and Wine. And this crazy guy is behind me. And I'm just like, oh, Lord. Let them ring things up faster so he doesn't talk to me. He like, that's, that's exactly what I'm at. Because I hear him like, yeah, go back to L.A. I'm so sick of everybody in this town. Just crazy. I'm like, oh, please ring me up. You, you know, and this lady's like, Marlboro Lights? Is that what you wanted? I'm like, please, I'm next. Please ring me up. I just stop. And the guy's like getting closer. And finally, it's my turn. And I'm ringing it through. I'm like, yes, you're going to talk to me. I'm leaving. And my daughter's like, quick, do you have a Give Jesus a Chance card? I'm like, for who? You know, not him, you know. And so she goes over to this guy, and she hands him the card. She says, sir, I'd love to invite you to church. And this guy is like, what church do you go to? I'm like, here it goes. And he, she's like, Joshua Springs. He's like, oh, that Pastor Gerald's church. I said, and she goes, yeah, it is. And he goes, I bet on a bunch of stocks because I heard secrets in his messages. And I was like, I knew he was crazy, you know. And he's like, he's like, now I'm stuck with all these stocks. I didn't sell them in time. And blah, 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 blah. and she's like, okay, you know. And she gets in the car, and I'm like, yeah, sometimes you're like the old lady. Sometimes and that did not stop my daughter from sharing the gospel. Even though there was a crazy guy every once in a while, that guy has to do something with a little humble girl handing him a give Jesus a chance card. It's not up to you to see the harvest. It's just up for you to be faithful to the call. As we leave here, I want you to focus on these five things in this story. The first one, let your life be a prayer, uh, let your life be a life of prayer and fasting that you may hear the call of the Lord upon your life. Second, let, let yourself be willing to seize the opportunities to share with others. Third, do not be discouraged by the opposition that you're going to face. Fourth, pray with boldness to share the gospel and to stand for righteousness. And the last one, Continue to pray for those that the Lord has put into your life that they may experience, too, the life-changing gospel that changed your life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we're thankful for your goodness. We're thankful for your mercy. We're thankful for Tuwilla and this church. Lord, would you just pour out a blessing upon it, Lord? I'm, I've been so blessed by the hospitality of this place. Lord, and just to see my brothers and sisters, Lord God, we are one body. And so, Lord, just thank you for having everyone be so kind to me since I've been here. And, Lord, we just pray uh, just for great things for this community. Lord, send us out. Lord, we want to to be attentive to who you want us to witness to and minister to. And so, Lord, we give you uh, our lives to do with what you want. And, Lord, uh, just please let us just focus on you with our life so we would be able to hear your voice in our life. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. God bless you.